All right, let's get started. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Charles Chamberlain, Executive Director of Democracy for America. Thank you for joining DFA's Political Revolution Night School, our interactive trainings designed to build key political skills in messaging, organizing, voter targeting, grassroots fundraising, and more. Tonight, we'll be talking about money, why grassroots fundraising is part of building the, mo mo building the movement, how to create a savvy, people-powered finance operation, tips on projecting and adjusting your plan throughout the campaign, and we'll learn more about what that means in the context of super PACs, Big Money, and Citizens United. We'll also talk about how to fundraise while staying true to our progressive values and why these skills are more important than ever if we're going to elect transformational leaders to higher office all over the country. And now, throughout the call, if you have a question, you can press zero on your phone to be connected with a DFA staff person. That's zero on your phone to be connected directly with a DFA staff person. Or, of course, you can submit your question online using the right-hand side of the web stream at democracyforamerica.com slash training. That's also where you can view the slides throughout the presentation. Now, speaking of transformational leaders, I'd like to introduce you to our special guest. Maggie Toulouse-Oliver is, in 2014, Democracy of America named Maggie to the Dean Dozen, and she earned Common Causes Best in Government 2015 award for her efforts to pass an online voter registration bill. Now she's a DFA-endorsed candidate running for New Mexico's Secretary of State and is going to share some of her tips and thoughts on why these skills are so important for people who care about building a more inclusive democracy. And with that, I'd like to welcome Maggie to the call. Hi, Maggie, are you there? Good, yes, I'm here. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me on the call today. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who is joining the call and how important it is and wonderful it is that you are all participating in this amazing night school that Democracy for America is putting on. Uh, for those of you who are candidates, uh, either this year or in the near future, thank you for running for office. Um, it's incredibly important that we have a diverse and representative group of individuals running for offices at all levels in our communities. It's the way in which each and every individual in this country uh, can feel like they have a, a choice when they go to the ballot box and that ultimately um, they will be able to elect representatives who, who look like Americans. And so I think it's fantastic if you're running or if you're working for a candidate or, or looking at doing so in the future, just thank you all for being active and engaged and involved. Um, so I was asked to be on the call tonight to talk just briefly about my experience running for office in New Mexico and how having a grassroots uh, fundraising component to uh, the way I raise money for my campaigns is so incredibly important. And um, just a little brief background about me. I am the county clerk in Bernalillo County, New Mexico, which is the largest county in New Mexico. And uh, I ran for that office twice in 2008 and 2012. So I was elected and reelected, and then again in 2014, I ran for Secretary of State, and that was my first attempt at running for statewide office. I ran against an incumbent who was uh, a sort of classic anti-voter participation candidate, very much in favor of things like strict photo voter ID regulations and a, a number of other policies to remove voters from the rolls and make it more difficult. And my campaign then and now was focused around increasing accessibility to the ballot, making it easier for people to vote, and having widespread participation in our democracy. Um, one of the ways that I chose to run my campaigns, both in 14 and now in 16, uh, is to reach out to individuals to help, to ask them to contribute to the campaign, even if they can't give a whole lot of money. Of course, you know, as, as we're running for office in this modern day and age, it's incredibly expensive, especially for a statewide office, but even at the local level, campaigns are becoming more and more expensive, and that's largely due to the effect of the Supreme Court Citizens United decision a few years back, which has really unleashed a wave of, of corporate and special interest money uh, onto our elections in unprecedented ways in the, in the last several years. Um, and it makes a candidate who is truly fighting for progressive values, especially those of us who want to reduce the influence of money in politics, 
uh, it makes it very challenging because very, very wealthy money special interests can get invested in these races, and typically they're going to get invested in races on behalf of candidates who are interested in supporting the status quo and in supporting the interests of, of those corporate and moneyed interests. And so what we have done with my campaign is we have made a, a concerted effort to reach out to individuals, to ask them to invest in our campaign, even if it's with a small amount, even if it's $1, $3, $5, um, a little bit at a time, what, whatever individuals can afford. And, and the truth is those contributions over time add up. And together, collectively, individuals making small contributions can make a tremendous difference. Um, in, in the race that I'm running this year, I'm running, of course, an, an individual who is raising, you know, tremendous large dollar contributions from the oil and gas industry in New Mexico and from legislators who have, as she, as she is a legislator herself, ties to lobbyists, corporate lobbyists, and other special interests. Um, her average campaign contribution is around $450. My average campaign contribution is $88. Um, and yet we have outraised in every single period uh, my opponent, and that is because we have a widespread group of individuals who are just citizens, uh, who are working people, who don't have uh, trust funds or, or investments or receive dividends on a monthly basis or, or corporations to write check for, checks from who can give a little bit at a time. And collectively together, those individuals uh, and over time, are, are able to help me stay not only competitive, but winning the money race uh, in this very important election. So as you're going into the training tonight um, and thinking about what you want to do with your campaigns, I just want to emphasize the importance of this, uh, making your campaign be as representative as we want our government to be, and encouraging individuals who uh, want to participate and want to give to give collectively together to help you to help boost your campaign and, and help you run a winning campaign. And again, uh, I want to thank you all for having me tonight and uh, for everything that you all are doing to make a difference in this country. Thank you again. You know, Maggie, before you go, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions. You know, you talked about the importance of uh, raising the money and, 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 and how small dollar contributions still make a difference, how they add up together. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm sure you experience is that so much of the attention is put on the presidential race, on uh, and um, if it's not the presidential race, then it's U.S. Senate races. And it, uh, you know, so do you have any suggestions for fundraising for statewide or local races that you've learned that help cut through uh, sort of the, uh, the celebrity of the presidential and, or the U.S. Senate races and make people interested in your race? Well, absolutely. You know, my particular race for Secretary of State is very focused on, again, uh, making sure that voters can participate in the election. Um, I think that um, when when you talk to, say, your your, your typical donor um, who is interested in supporting a presidential candidate or a congressional candidate, and and of course you're right, those are those are the the sexy races. Those are the races that garner all the t the attention, but when I talk to people who donate to those races, uh, as well as others, I explain to them uh, the importance of the Secretary of State's office and how the decisions that can be made at the Secretary of State's level can impact elections and can ultimately impact the outcome of elections and why it's so important to have a person in that position who is uh, running elections fairly and who is running elections with a goal in mind of fostering participation and encouraging and increasing voter participation and how that uh, can ultimately affect uh, the outcome of elections in a very positive way. And so for folks who want to continue to see progressives get elected at all levels uh, from the presidency on down, um, they, they can make that connection. And so as, as, as folks are, are trying to raise money and they're running for a lower office or an office that isn't as high profile, making the connection for donors about how that local office uh, can ultimately move the ball forward uh, for what we are trying to accomplish as a progressive movement um, is very important. Um, talking about 
how policy decisions get made at the local issue and then sometimes get elevated to the national uh, to the national spotlight, talking about how candidates from the local level are our bench, are our future candidates for higher political office. And of course, talking about if you're running for a, a position that affects uh, how elections are run, making that connection for them as well. That's, that makes a lot of sense, I, and I can see how that would be compelling in driving people to support the campaign. Uh, I, I know that also from our experience, sometimes it can be hugely helpful to connect people on the issues, finding the, the ways in which uh, you know, the, the issues that are important to them connect to the campaign, because so often uh, all, you know, all the issues can connect, whether it's a school board or a state representative or secretary of state like yourself, all the way up to the presidency, uh, which leads me to sort of a, a secondary question, which is, you know, how do you see, uh, you know, policies or around big money in politics and voting rights as being interrelated? How do they affect each other? Well, it's what it comes down to at the end of the day is um, the, the types of things that we're seeing happening on the national playing field, uh, the, the, the Citizens United decision, um, redistricting uh, across the country into um, non-competitive uh, districts, uh, mm -hmm. the, um, the influence of, of, of corporate money in our elections, these are all going towards supporting candidates who are interested in limiting the scope of participation across this country. And they're interested in limiting the scope of participation because when you have fewer voters coming out to vote, um, they tend to support the status quo and those interests uh, that, are, that are in power in order to retain power. And so the best way for us to be able to shake up and make change and get people into the positions uh, that we need them to be in in order to overturn some of these negative policies, in other words, to, to uh, support things like public financing, to repeal Citizens United, to increase transparency, and ultimately to pass laws that are going to make it easier for voters to participate is by going out to the polls and electing these people. And, uh, you know, of course, the only way that can happen is when uh, we have competitive candidates who can raise uh, the kind of money that they need to to communicate that message to voters. Fantastic. That makes a lot of sense. I think you really put that well. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us on the call tonight and giving us your uh, very specific uh, perspective. Uh, I, I definitely want to let you get back to the campaigning you need to do. Uh, I do want to say for everybody that's listening to this call, if you're interested in supporting Maggie in her race, this critical race in New Mexico, uh, you should go to her website and contribute or volunteer to work on the campaign. Her website address is MaggieToloseOliver.com. Uh, let me spell that for you. That's M-A-G-G-I-E-T-O-U-L-O-U-S-E-O-L-I-V-E-R.com. All right, and with that, I'd like to turn this over to Annie, our electoral director here at Democracy for America, to talk about key principles to get grassroots fundraising in this moment. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlie, and thank you so much, Maggie. Uh, it is an honor to get to have you on this call, and uh, we just saw a comment in from Rusty uh, in, the, in the web chat that says, Go, Maggie. I can't wait to vote for you. So that is awesome. Uh, thank you so much. So... We're going to dig in now to a few things about why grassroots fundraising is organizing, why fundraising builds our movement. And I have five big things I want to talk about here. Uh, but before I dig into those five big things, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to tell some stories in the web chat. So uh, if you have a few things to share about what is challenging about raising money, what's hard about talking about money because we know that it is challenging a lot of times. It's a taboo often to talk about money. Things that are challenging about, about raising funds, go ahead and, and share some thoughts about that in the web chat now. Um, and we'll have some time uh, to share those towards this, uh, a little bit later in the call. Um, and I'd also like to invite you to share a couple of things about grassroots fundraising that have been powerful for you. If you have an experience where you've donated money to something, a candidate, a cause, uh, a local group, a national group, and it was a good experience for you, it was something that made you proud and something that made you inspired, um, please share something about that in the web chat now. Why did you do it? What made you give? Uh, so again, 
you have a couple things to share about what has been hard about raising money, uh, what's holding you back, add that in the web chat. And if you have some stories to share about a time that you've given money and it's been a powerful, great experience, share a little bit about why that was so in the web chat as well. Uh, and we'll get to hear some of those stories from you all in a little bit. But let's dig into the five big things about why grassroots fundraising is movement building and awesome. Uh, number one, it builds up our supporters and expands our base. So in order to do a big grassroots fundraising drive, you need to have a huge number of compelling conversations, the kind of interactions that uh, Bree talked about last week in our session on narrative building, uh, with lots of people about things that are important to them and are important to you. Uh, it forces you to have often hundreds and hundreds of calls and conversations uh, with folks about these things. And once people pitch in to an effort, they are that much more likely to stay involved, to stay engaged, to become volunteer leaders, uh, to donate again, and to stay up to date with the campaign and the work. Um, and I'm going to tell a short story about that. So uh, I was Ilya Shaman's campaign manager in 2012. Uh, he's now the executive director of Move On, um, but he's an amazing progressive leader, community organizer. Uh, and there was one night, it was our first big fundraising deadline, and we had a whole bunch of us, the staff team, all the volunteers, we were all making calls in the campaign office because we wanted to be able to raise the first $100,000 on the campaign. We knew how important this deadline was. He was a young, uh, insurgent progressive, uh, and we knew that being able to say that, that we'd hit this big goal and welcomed so many people into the campaign was going to be huge for building momentum and being able to run the kind of campaign that we wanted to run. And the room was packed. Uh, so, you know, we had the, the letter carriers were there. We had students from the local high school. We had a whole crew of folks um, volunteering from the Longshoremen. Uh, and we were all making phone calls, and it was awesome to uh, ask folks in our community and in our networks to pitch in 5 10 20 bucks to do what they could uh, so we could get to this goal. Um, and the energy in the room was amazing. And then we heard a tornado siren. <laughs> the, sky, uh, the sky turned yellow. Uh, and I remember telling everybody, I was like, we have to get folks home. Maybe we should stop. Uh, but they wouldn't stop because we hadn't hit that goal yet. Um, and I remember we had a glass front window in the office, and I made everybody move to the back because it was shaking because the, there was this massive storm with these tornadoes going off. But folks kept phone banking. Um, we hit the goal that night, and eventually we grew to more than 20,000 individual folks pitching in, which was one of the biggest bases of any congressional primary in the country. And it was through that process that we expanded the base of leaders. We built out a lot of folks who were ready to fundraise and call upon their communities and their circles and welcome them into the campaign. And then those folks who pitched in uh, became recruiters as well. So fundraising is organizing, uh, and it's one of the key ways that you can actually build up your supporters and expand your base. And that's important for reason number two. Number two, uh, we want to diversify and systematize accountability. We know that big money in politics is a problem. And more donors means that you have more built-in input, you have more accountability to more people, and more folks that you're regularly communicating with, uh, so that they can force you to govern with those values that you campaigned on when you get elected. So that's one of the biggest problems, right? If it's only a tiny pool of people uh, that are able to fund uh, fund this work and fund these campaigns, then it's a tiny pool of people that uh, often control some of these important decisions that impact all of our lives. Um, so uh, we have to be able to diversify and, and systematize accountability and build it in. Uh, number three, uh, in fundraising as also organizing. This is also about educating the public on timely issues. So when we're talking to people and asking folks to pitch in, it means that we're telling them more about the campaign. We're talking about issues around voting rights and access, like what Maggie Toulouse Oliver was speaking of. It means that we're talking about uh, the NRA and uh, gun violence prevention. It means that we're talking about uh, um, how to fight income inequality and key policies on city council to uh, fund and invest in public schools. Um, so there's a process of education that comes with needing to regularly build and communicate with folks um, as we're fundraising. Um, I'm going to go to number four. So number four, uh, grassroots fundraising makes you more flexible, and it, therefore it makes you more powerful. So we've already talked about how if you have a tiny pool of donors, you have a smaller pool of people to be accountable to. But what that also means is that that tiny pool of people can often have an outside influence on goals, strategies, and tactics. And we see this in you know, the nonprofit sector, 
uh, and in other realms as well besides campaigns. But uh, when you have a base of support, especially recurring donations, that is stable uh, and growing, it means that people trust you and your campaign operation enough to be good stewards of those resources. And it means that you can plan in advance and make the fast decisions that you need to make uh, without uh, having it all be too controlled by tiny pools of uh, well-funded individuals. Um, so big grassroots fundraising makes you more flexible, more adaptable, uh, and therefore more able to respond in the 24-hour news cycle. And number five, uh, this is my favorite one, uh, it's so we win. <laughs> we have important stuff to do. Uh, there's amazing campaigners that need to be paid for their labor. There's uh, offices that need to be opened. Um, there's media buys that need to be purchased. Uh, we need to fund smart, powerful, winning campaigns, and we can't do it without uh, without the funds. So uh, with that, um, we're going to go to the, the next slide, uh, keeping these five things in mind about why grassroots fundraising is awesome. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about why people give. Um, and I'm going to share another story um, about uh, what I've been thinking about earlier today. So, you know, I just got back from a political event. I'm wearing a fancy outfit. Um, this fancy outfit mostly came from a sweatshop, probably. Um, it was probably created by people who were not paid well for their labor. Um, I put gas in my car, and that's ruining the earth. You know, every day, just to have a normal day, we have to spend money on things that hurt our environment, that hurt our communities, uh, just to be able to get through the day for most of us. And yes, there are lifestyle decisions that we could make that might make that better. Um, but you know, recently I got a call from a candidate uh, running for a transit board, and I pitched in joyfully and willingly because she was giving me a chance to do something with my money uh, that I didn't have to do that was powerful and systemic and that was good for my community. Uh, so we are giving folks a chance an opportunity uh, to do something powerful with their money in a moment when that's hard to come by for a lot of us. So um, this slide shows just a few reasons uh, that people give and ways to think about these different kinds of donors as you're building out your strategy uh, to welcome more folks into the campaign. So um, you see there at the very center, there's the, there's the candidate. Lots of candidates pitch in uh, their own time and uh, resources and funds. Um, Self-funding is a piece that comes with a lot of campaigns. Uh, relational donors uh, are close and related to um, the, the person that is asking them. So uh, this is often the candidate's inner circle. This is someone that is a relative, a friend, a colleague, a community member that you may already know. Um, there are people that already feel invested and care about the individual. Uh, and these relational donors might not even always agree ideologically with uh, the candidate's positions or their fight, but they care about the human being that's asking them. Um, and that uh, giving definitely works well when it's the candidate themselves, um, but when you build out a big fundraising operation, that can sometimes happen with the volunteer leaders or the people hosting the house party, right? It's not just relational to the candidate alone. It can be relational to anyone who's doing the asking. Um, but giving because of the, the individual themselves. Uh, ideological donors are that, that next ring out. So ideological folks are people who are very invested in a cause or issue. Um, they've been called to do some specific work about something that is impacting their lives um, or the lives of their loved ones, and they give to that cause, whether it's money in politics, reproductive rights, uh, fighting climate change. And if the candidate shares that donor's passion, then the donor might see that shared commitment as a way to further the cause. So donors in that realm are looking for a common passion and a commitment to, to that cause. Uh, the next pool I want to talk about uh, are aversion donors. So uh, these are folks that are mainly interested in making the other candidate lose. Uh, so the opponent's victory is likely to affect this donor uh, in an adverse manner, or it's already hurt the potential donor if they're an incumbent. Um, these donors want to hear fear and hope and urgency. Um, they want to know that the candidate understands what is at stake if they lose, that they are providing a genuinely viable alternative, which is the hope, uh, and that they can do something right now to make a difference uh, and change the outcome of this election, which is the urgency. So again, uh, these donors are all about the stakes, which is the fear, uh, 
providing a viable alternative, which is the hope, and that they can do something right now to make a difference, which is the urgency. Um, the last category I want to talk about um, is called access donors. Um, so this is uh, uh, sounds a bit transactional, but what we mean by that is that they want to see an ally in the office, uh, someone who's going to represent their interests in that office. And the primary concern for those donors is viability. Are they going to back the winning candidate? Um, they're giving because they hope to hold that office holder accountable by providing financial support. And once the viability is established, that donor now needs to know that the candidate is going to uh, fight and lead on those donors' issues. Um, so typically, uh, you work from the inner circle out as you're growing your campaign. And as you raise money from your innermost, innermost circle of donors, your viability is going to increase and grow. You're going to build that energy. And donors farther out will increasingly see your campaign as a viable you know, recipient of, uh, of that fundraising. Um, and uh, if you can't raise money from the folks that are closest to you, that have fought alongside you, that are in your community, um, people are going to uh, have some skepticism about your campaign. So um, casting a wide net and brainstorming in a big way folks that would be excited about your race and are connected to you in that way is the place to start. Um, and I'm going to go into some key principles in a minute, but um, I just want to bring it back again to what Bree spoke about last week in terms of developing your narrative. Uh, across the board, great fundraising is about making the stakes in the election clear, listening to the voter, the potential donor and leader, and then calling on them to take what we think of as a really heroic action by stepping up and joining something that's going to serve their hopes and needs uh, and interests, and that's your campaign. So uh, let's go to the next uh, the next slide. Um, here's some, some key principles um, to uh, keep hold of as we um, as we think about fundraising. So uh, number one, be ready to hear no. Um, some folks are born yeses, so some, some people were like me uh, just waiting to get that call um, from that transit board candidate, uh, and I was going to say yes right away. And your job with those folks is to maximize their support. Some folks are on the fence. Uh, there's something holding them back, some nervousness about if politics works at all. They don't have a lot of money to spare. They give to a lot of causes already. Uh, and your job is to build a campaign operation worthy of their investment and support uh, and to tip them, over, uh, tip them over the fence and address their concerns and, and welcome them in. Uh, and some folks are no's, and that is okay. The best fundraisers in the world get used to hearing no a lot, uh, and that's fine. Uh, makes you tough, uh, so get used to hearing no. Uh, number two, be confident. You're not going to waste their money, uh, and I trust that none of you are going to run a campaign to waste folks' money, right? Uh, you're going to build a powerhouse team of staffers. You're going to communicate to voters about things that matter, and you're going to fight tirelessly to win progressive victories, right? Right. So if you're not, then you should feel bad for asking money. But if you are going to do that, then you should feel great and confident about asking them to pitch in. Um, and that relates to your tone and language as well. So use strong, assumptive language. We're fighting for this policy. We're working to launch our next office, things like that, not things like we're trying to hopefully maybe do this thing, right? We want to be strong and confident and ask them for a firm commitment. Uh, and the last point uh, in going in with the right mindset is to have a clear and concise theory of change. We spoke about this last week a bit, but again, a theory of change just clearly articulates how and why taking this action, in this case, pitching into the campaign, but it also applies to volunteering, running a day of action, hosting a phone bank, um, why it's going to make a real difference. So. It means that you let them know what their money is going towards and why it's important that they get involved right away. And we believe that this reason always needs to be true. It's not good to tell people that Donald Trump will definitely win if you don't give $5 right now, because that's not actually the true stakes, and people know that. But it is often true that we need to raise 1000 more dollars by the end of the week if we're going to be able to bring on an amazing new organizer to cover a whole new region. right? So have a clear theory of change for what you're asking for and why. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to pause uh, before we dig into some of the specifics around building an amazing finance plan. Um, we have some, some time now for some questions. Uh, so if you have a question, again, you can press zero on your phone to be connected with a DFA staff person um, or submit a question using the right-hand side of the web stream at www.democracyforamerica.com 
slash training. Fantastic. And Annie, while we're waiting for uh, people to potentially call in, we've been getting tons of web questions. Uh, so I've got one right now from Elizabeth. Uh, she says, uh, I'm running for city council. How soon should I start raising money? That's a great question, Elizabeth. Uh, congrats on taking the plunge and running for city council. Uh, so you should start raising money uh, right away as soon as you have filed the appropriate paperwork. Uh, that is a different workshop. Uh, you can find some tips and tools on that in the Archive Night School on our website about filing some of that paperwork. But uh, you should start building your base of support right away. Uh, some of the timeline depends on when your election is, naturally. If your election is coming up very soon, then you know start raising money yesterday. Uh, but in general, uh, you should get started very quickly in building the base of support so that you can uh, have the resources you need to grow your campaign. You know, following up on that, is there a point when you stop raising money? Like, should you not be raising money um, the day before the election? That is a great question. Uh, the day before the election, uh, you want to be able to full-on focus on talking to voters and getting out in the field and doing media and things like that. So I would say that, uh, in general, uh, you want to be able to get to a place where you are raising money uh, until nearly the end, but that in the final get out the vote push, you're able to focus on uh, being out in the field. So, uh, you know, I love this next question that we've got from Gary also from the web chat. Uh, you know, Gary asks, uh, is it possible to accept money from large donors with no strings attached? That is a great question. And uh, I'd actually, Charlie, do you want to take a stab at uh, your thoughts on that? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. You know, I think I, I love this question because as someone who talks to, uh, you know, members of Democracy for America who donate to us all the time, uh, you know, we have uh, the vast majority of our money that comes in comes in from small donors. Uh, in fact, 99.2% of our donations come in at $100 or less, and our average contribution is just $17.67. That's right, $17. We beat Bernie on the size of our small dollar contributions to support our organization, which is fantastic. But we definitely also accept large contributions uh, when we can. If we've got donors that are willing to give us larger numbers, uh, we'll take it because it's important to have uh, as much resources as we can to make sure we win. Uh, and what I can say is that from my personal experience, yes, it's absolutely possible to take money from large donors with no strings attached. In fact, many donors understand that. Many donors understand that, that uh, you know, what you're doing is you're pitching them on the ideas, on the vision you have for America, on the work that you're trying to get done, and they're either going to be on board with that or they aren't. And as long as you're pitching authentically the work that you're going to do, then you can accept contributions for any amount from anyone. Uh, the key is, obviously, is that you don't want to go to someone and say, what do you want me to do? Uh, pay me and I'll do it. Uh, that's, you know, that's obviously strings attached from day one. Uh, so I think it's really about your attitude in your fundraising. Uh, it's up to you to decide, I'm not going to take money from these donors and do something for them specifically because they gave money to me. I'm going to pitch them on my vision for how I want to move America forward, uh, and they're either going to give or they aren't. Uh, so I think that's the key. It's your own personal authenticity. Right. Yep. Uh, and I'd say, you know, actually having pay-to-play strings attached is not allowed, right? You know, that's uh, a thing that uh, is not allowed ostensibly within the rules, right? But we know that that's part of the problem with Citizens United and some of these laws around, you know, it's why we need so much, uh, why we need better laws around campaign finance reform. Uh, and I think uh, it's also, in some ways, you know, we, we're a member-driven organization, and we care about our members, and we want to treat the money that they've given us uh, really well, right? So I don't know if that qualifies as strings attached, right? It means that we care about folks that have pitched in, because a lot of folks don't have a lot of money, uh, but still make it happen uh, to pitch in a few bucks when they can, and that's an important, valuable thing. Uh, people have uh, time, and they have money to pitch in to these campaigns, and they're both very valuable and deserve to be honored. So... Fantastic. Um, well, we go to a yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, Annie, why don't we go to a live question? And, uh, and in fact, our next uh, uh, um, presenter is going to be uh, Chris from our team, our finance director here at D DFA. Maybe Chris wants to answer this question. Uh, William Hamilton uh, has a question. Are you on the line, William? Yes, sir, I am. Fantastic. Why don't you go ahead and ask? 
My name is William Hamilton, and I am the executive director of Low Country Up is Good, a progressive political action committee focused on the local issues of affordable housing, better public transit, and a living wage in Charleston, South Carolina. We're currently engaged in a, a referendum to raise $660 million to build a better regional rapid transit system for the low country. I've got That's some fantastic, absolute- William. What's, what, what's your question for Chris? Um, I've got some great young people working incredibly hard on this campaign, one of which didn't have money for lunch yesterday. They're, they're, they're working for absolute peanuts now. The question is, what is a fast way to raise a, a modest amount of money so that I can keep these people working without them not missing their rent payments while we amp up to the phone banking and the events we need to increase the scale of fundraising? What is a simple mechanism for getting a couple of thousand bucks into the crankcase so the engine's got oil in it? Great question, William. Chris, you got an answer for us? Yeah, it's a great question, William. I mean, I think a lot of campaigns and candidates, as they're getting started, sort of have this moment of, okay, so now I'm running. I have this referendum I'm going on. What do I do next? And as Annie pointed out earlier, uh, talking through the motivations of why people give, uh, the different levels of people that are looking at giving, uh, the relational, the ideological, uh, et cetera, this, um, this is where you want to start. You want to think through who are the people you can go to who can get on the phone and ask for money right away. That usually is your relational uh, aspect. To be people that you can pull from your Rolodex, to be people that you pull out in your calendar that you get a meeting with. Specifically, William, for yours, I would do a little research on who are people in the area that could be ideological, but people who in your area uh, share about the issues that you're, you guys are working for. Um, in a nutshell, though, that is where I would say um, you should start. That makes a lot of sense, uh, and I appreciate you take, answering that. Uh, you know, we do have a, a question from uh, the web chat that I think is uh, great here and specifically really relevant today, uh, the last day of the quarter. Uh, Karen asks, you know, how if you're using an online fundraising campaign as part of your mechanism for raising money, how do you make sure your emails stand out for the barrage of fundraising emails that people receive? Uh, Chris, you, or, I'm sorry, I'm not sure oh, I was sorry. clear. Uh, yeah, can you take this, Chris? <laughs> um, well, actually, Carly, I would love to get your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I can tell you, you know, from uh, you know the years of experience at DFA, one of the things that we have found uh, is um, it's really about the relationship that you've built with your members. Uh, you know, it's not about whether or not you're going to stand out on a day when they're getting 30 emails because you've got the most incredible subject line or the content inside your email is just that brilliant. I mean, sure, those things help, uh, but, but the reality is is that opening uh, of emails in the long run really comes down to the relationship you're building with your membership, with your supporters. So if you're being authentic, if you're uh, uh, communicating clearly, you're providing information, you have uh, um, you know, uh, useful uh, uh, actions for people to be taking, rather than just wasting people's time or constantly scaring them, uh, that's going to make a big difference as to whether or not uh, people open your emails at any point. All right, great. I think with that, uh, I think it might be time for us to move back into the training now. Uh, why don't we uh, have you take it away, Chris? All right, guys. Let's hop into the basics of budget and finance planning. For this first part, I'm going to keep it pretty much at a 30,000-foot level. Uh, we're going to talk about goals, timelines, and benchmarks, the strategy and targeting, and then the tactic and tools to run a successful fundraising campaign. <clears throat> goals, timelines, and benchmarks. How much will your campaign cost? Well, it's going to depend on your district, on your candidate, the office you're running for, your opponent or opponents, and a whole host of other factors. Your initial research into your candidate, district, and past campaigns should give you a ballpark idea of how much money you need to raise to stay competitive. Be sure to look into your opponent's past campaigns as well. If you're running against an incumbent or someone who has previously ran, getting an idea of how much they have raised and spent is helpful as you begin your research. You will need to research the cost of everything your campaign will need to win. From the beginning, your finance director should figure out three budget scenarios, lean, modest, and robust. This allows flexibility if your spending priorities need to adjust to changing your unanticipated cash flow issues. Break down your final fundraising goal along a timeline. 
so you have the money you need before you have to spend it. The candidate's time early on should be spent primarily fundraising. Establish a timeline and plot fundraising benchmarks. As your campaign grows, finances will be increasingly directed towards voter contact activities, and the candidate will have more time for these activities. Meeting or exceeding your benchmarks means your campaign and your finance plan is on track. Failing to meet these benchmarks means your finance plan and your campaign are failing and you're going to have to adjust course. Strategies and targeting. As Andy noted, most people give to campaigns for a whole host of reasons. But by asking folks to pitch in, you're giving them an opportunity to take strategic action towards things they care about or a person they care about. I like to think of asking someone to make a contribution as making an investment. It's often the way we will phrase an ask, especially a larger one when we're on call time at DFA. Why do people give to campaigns? Understanding the different motivations is key to fundraising. Don't think of your fundraising activities as giving a donor a reason to contribute. It's about discovering their reason. Campaign donations are a form of activism. Whenever a campaign or organization asks something of someone, listening is a key component. You can discover a person's motivation just by listening to that potential donor. Nonetheless, you should have a good idea of the donor's motivations before even starting your pitch. Donor motivations generally fall under the four categories Annie described above, relational, ideological, aversion, and access. The tactics and tools. We're gonna to dive deeper into this later, but the various methods that you use to reaching out to donors, events, call time, one-on-one -on -one meetings, direct mail solicitations, email fundraising, will be the key way that you plan out how your money will come in the door. All right, now that we've talked at the 30,000 foot level, let's get into the nitty gritty of planning. Plan for all scenarios. Campaigns need to have a North Star. They need to have a clear sense of what their priorities are, where they need to double down, and what they need to invest in in terms of field organizing, staff, media, in order to connect with their voters, build their support, and turn out voters on election day. With that, you need a few different versions of your budget. All successful campaigns that I've worked on have had what we would call either a Cadillac plan all the way down to the old Winnebago. Whatever your favorite car metaphor is, you need to know how you'll spend a bare bones budget if a key ally pulls resources or how you will expand your programs if you suddenly get a in massive influx of money. This is particularly important for candidates to know. If you know you're build raising money into a smart, clear plan to build something real, it's far easier to get on the phone and ask a donor to make a contribution. And donors want to know what their donation or investment will be spent on. All right, now these are the key principles you wanna keep in mind as you begin crafting your finance plan. Be explicit and everything has to be written down. I always like to say that if it's not written down, then it's not real. It's great to have ideas of how you will spend your time and how much money and when it will come in the door, but until it's on paper, it's not real. Number two, set specific quantifiable goals and establish benchmarks. I like to set quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily goals to have immediate knowledge of progress. Number three, create a timeline and work backwards. Think about what is your end product or your final goal and plan out each step on the way to make that happen using specific dates and deadlines. Number four, revise and update. In fundraising, you always have to be evaluating your success, reconsidering the tactics you're using and the time you're spending on those tactics, and most importantly, revising your spending plans based off of fundraising su success or hardship. When you're setting goals, you need to make sure you follow the SMART matrix here, that they are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. This is true across the board for all various aspects of your campaign plan, but it's especially true for your finance program. Now, on these next two slides, we gave you a sample finance plan. The first slide is going to show you the total goal we had established and how we broke that down by month. Then when you look on the next slide called sample finance plan, we actually broke it down by month and by tactic. This is how you're going to approach your own plan. You're going to work backwards from explicit deadlines with reasonable projections and working all the way back from the goals that you need to hit. Figuring out how the various tactics will fit in with one another is the key step in your finance planning and it's where we're going to start next. All right, before we dive into the actual tactics, let's talk about the expectations by tactics first. These are fairly intuitive concepts, but here are some critical things to go through as you make the plan day-to-day -day to work backwards from your goals. What is your response rate? 
This is the percent of people asked will make a contribution. The cost, percent of each dollar spent in raising that dollar. Cash flow, how quickly will the money be in the bank that, so you can spend it on the campaign program you need to fund? Time, whose time does this consume? How time intensive is the tactic? Messenger, who is making the ask? And lastly, who is the target donor? Who are you trying to reach based off the giving level you're working towards? What does this all mean then? The most high yield and efficient nature of raising money over the phone means it is the most successful tactic. Candidates should spend almost all of her fundraising time doing call time. Successful campaigns have a candidate spend five or more hours a day on the phone. It's worth taking some time before you decide to run to assess if you can handle that kind of commitment. Even in a small race, that's what serious viability may take. Okay, so I've got a couple of stories to share with you. Both of these stories are around candidates who did not like call time. They had a hard time doing it. It was uncomfortable for them, but they ended uh, their campaigns ended in very different scenarios. 2005, I went to work for a woman running for attorney general. She had hired two staffers, a finance consultant, rented office space, and began funding her campaign entirely with her own funds. We began building her fundraising list just like everyone else should, starting with her relational donors, looking through all of her calendars, her phone, her emails, etc. We built her a list, but before we had even made the first phone call, she had already spent tens of thousands of her own dollars. By the time we started call time and trying to raise money, she just could not do it. Every tactic we tried, everything we tried to make her more comfortable with asking people for money, she just couldn't do it. In the end, she dropped out after two months. She never ran for office again, and all of the amazing things she could have done as an elected official didn't happen because she couldn't find a way to get comfortable raising money over the phone. The second story, though, I have is someone who was equally frightened of making a phone call to ask for money. She was the Speaker of the House and was working towards getting the largest majority, uh, a veto-proof majority that she could in her state house. She hated getting on the phone and asking for money. It made her incredibly uncomfortable. It was not something that she was used to doing. But instead of giving up, she was motivated, though, by her goal of getting that veto-proof majority. And so instead of giving up, she persevered. She worked with her staff to come up with ways that made it, it more comfortable for her. We did research to make sure she knew who she was talking with, how much money that person could potentially give her, and every piece of information that we could find on the internet to help her feel comfortable making that ask to people. We found tricks to make it more comfortable just for her personally. Sometimes she had a glass of wine beforehand, uh, but whatever it took, we helped her do that. And in the end, we won that veto proof majority in the house and she went on to run for statewide office later, which was something that she never had dreamed of when we began this uh, scenario. So all of this isn't to frighten you off from running. You need to run for office, it's amazing, you should do it. But get comfortable with the idea of asking someone for money over the phone, someone you may know, someone you may have a personal relationship with. The most successful campaigns, like we said earlier, use their candidates' fundraising time to make phone calls because it's the most efficient and most effective way to get money in the door quickly. So just think about that before you decide to run and come up with tactics and ways that are gonna make it more comfortable for you to make it successful. This table we provided on the different tactics uh, is a good way for candidates to begin looking at the different tactics as well as their fundraising staff. And it's a good way to help prioritize everyone's time Staff's time should be primarily spent preparing for call time, planning events, managing mailings, and doing email fundraising. All right, that was a lot of information. So uh, before we move on, we do have a little bit more of information to cover, but before we move there, let's pause for a moment and take some questions. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. You know, I've got um, a good question from Cindy online who asked if you could give an example of a good pitch to a donor with a solid theory of change. Uh, is that something you could just whip off the top of your head here? <laughs> um, sure. So what I would say a good theory of change is really based off of what your campaign and candidate is trying to achieve. An example of something that, uh, you know, I would say for, you know, what we would use here at DFA is, 
uh, we would be very specific um, to currently, right now, we're doing a lot of training. So a good theory of change and a good ask that Charlie would make on the phone would be, can you pitch in $100 today? We are doing online training, training a community of organizers to take uh, important information into their communities and run progressive campaigns. We've done five trainings. Uh, we are doing one more. We need your investment today to help us get um, this next training running successfully. Uh, that's excellent. a very specific ask. Um, Charlie, do you have anything else to add on it? Yeah, no, I think that's excellent. That was pretty good to come up uh, with that uh, off the top of your head. I, definitely the key is, uh, you know, a theory of change is um, connecting the dots between what it is you're asking for uh, you know, financially and where it's going to be spent. So whether it's, you know, in the case of Chris's example of fundraising to continue to do online trainings like this one, uh, or if it's even just something as simple as saying, uh, you know, uh, I've got five canvassers going out tonight. They're all volunteering to knock on doors, and we'd like to have pizza for them when they get back. Can you contribute $30 right now? Uh, the, that's another example of a solid theory of change because you're connecting the dots between what it is that they're giving and what they're giving for. And even better is when you can connect it to the goals that we're after together. So if I were to take the pizza example and expand on it, I might say, I've got five canvassers out there right now campaigning to make sure that we're going to be able to elect uh, Maggie Toulouse Oliver to Secretary of State because she's going to make uh, you know, uh, our state work well again uh, for voters. Uh, and that's why I need you to give $30 right now to help have the pizza be ready when those canvassers come back. Then what you've done is you've put all the pieces together of selling a solid theory of change. Uh, so uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that hopefully answers your question, Cindy. Uh, here's another question we got online, which is, um, you know, what are some of the best ways to figure out how much money uh, I need to raise? Great question. Um, I covered that a little bit above, but when you're beginning the research into your race, the very first place that I would start is looking at the past campaigns that have been run. So thinking about the district that you're running in and the office that you're running, all of the information of past campaigns is usually available online, either through the town's website, the state's website, or through the FEC, depending on what, um, just what level of office you're running for. I would really start there looking at both sides of the, um, of the race. The past like five elections or so would be a great place to start. That's going to give you a really good idea of um, how much money was spent to win, how much money the other side spent, uh, and you'll also usually be able to see what they spent their money on so you can see if they funded a really great grassroots operation or if they spent all their money uh, on TV ads. Uh, and so that's the, that's the very first place I would start. Um, and then if you know the candidates that have run before, talking to those candidates to get an idea from them, uh, and then talking to your local Democratic or Progressive Committees, uh, local DFA groups, uh, they also usually have a lot of knowledge on um, the past races. Excellent. Uh, you know, another question coming in online is, uh, you know, what is the first steps that you take, you know, in developing your first call list? Uh, you know, who should you, who should the candidate be calling right off the bat? That's a great question. Um, the, so the very first rung of whom Annie mentioned earlier, relational, that is where you want to spend the beginning and the most of your time, uh, no matter what office you're running for. I uh, Pull out uh, your calendar, uh, your phone, your uh, kids' classmates list. Uh, if you're in any organizations or, uh, you know, sports leagues, uh, groups that you're a part of, uh, look through your Facebook friends, uh, and then expand out. So those are, like, people that you're pretty immediately attached to. From there, you're going to expand even more into who's your holiday card list. Look through your past yearbooks. Look through your professional associations, your colleagues. Uh, you want to think as personal and as specific to you as possible. Uh, if you're working for a campaign or a, a candidate, that means going to their house and looking through every potential piece of paper that they have. Um, you know, if they are a practicing lawyer, looking through, you know, lawyers' associations. Um, really think through who they are and who they can be connected with. 
that is going to be your absolute first and best list to build from. Um, that's who you want to make your first calls to. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Now, um, can you give us maybe, Chris, uh, um, some more tricks on how to get through call time? Uh, you know, you talked about the example, the person that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't even convince uh, to ever make calls and ended up having to drop out of the race. Um, but what, what were some of the things you did in the, the second case where the person was having a hard time uh, and was trying to uh, uh, get through it? You know, were there tricks that made it possible? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've always found with no matter what candidate I'm working for, the more information I can have on the donor, um, the more likely they are to make a good ask and to feel confident making that ask. So I will do research on that donor, um, Googling, Facebooking, uh, and also looking up their giving history to other people. Uh, we're going to cover this in a little bit, but a lot of um, a lot of giving history is available online through different resources. You can't use that information to uh, build your own fundraising list, but you can use it as a way to get an idea of how much you should ask for. So giving information um, is one of the best things. Uh, and also just figuring out those um, motivations for your candidate. So my one example, that candidate, she was super motivated. She wanted to have the biggest house majority. She wanted all these amazing people to be her colleagues in um, the state house. Uh, and so she didn't have to be goaded or scared. She just needed um, encouragement and support. Some candidates might have to be, you know, set up in a competition. They may respond to numbers. Uh, they may respond to a little bit of harsh reality um, that if they don't get on the phone, then their campaign is not going to happen. And that was a tactic I actually used a lot with the um, first campaign example that I gave uh, because she was using all of her own money. And if she didn't get on the phone, we were going to have to shut down and she wouldn't end up being attorney general. And that's what happened. Um, and so you just have to find out what the motivation of that candidate is. And then, like I said, I mean, you can find out also just like little – personal tricks that make it work. Uh, you know, I've used chocolate as encouragement or a way to get them in the door. I've also used, uh, you know, soda or wine or whatever, little things like that that make me excited. Um, you know, with Charlie in particular, he does call time. Uh, he's very numbers driven. And so his call time manager uses numbers with Charlie all the time. He can um, uh, excited about it and see his progress. Yeah, I can't deny it. There's nothing more exciting than when we've got a goal and then we go out, we reach it, and we hit it. Uh, so that definitely motivates me and is one of the key things that keeps me going throughout call time. Uh, you know, so, you know, one of the questions we can, that came in online that I think is an interesting one, uh, you know, it says, I found that many people don't answer their phones anymore. Are, are there methods uh, off the phone to supplement your call time? Yeah. Um Definitely. I mean, we still um, find that call time is the most effective. You may have to call people a couple of times to get them to pick up. Uh, you may want to try from a different phone. Uh, if you're using your own cell phone, use your call time manager's phone, use a landline. Uh, don't give up on call time because it is the most effective way and most efficient way to get money in the door quickly, um, and you're going to get to be able to make a specific ask where uh, emails or direct mail uh, events you're not making a one-on-one -on -one personal solicitation, so you aren't going to maximize that person's investment in your campaign. But the other tactics of email, direct mail, uh, events, house parties, those are all great tactics that should be put into your fundraising plan. Um, but given the, uh, the right amount of time for the, the staff to spend on it and then the candidate to spend on it. And like we said, the candidate should be spending the most amount of time on one-on-one -on -one interactions with donors through call time and sometimes for meetings. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I think why don't you uh, wrap this up? Uh, I know we've got a couple more uh, slides here, but a little bit more learning left to do. Let's do it. All right. Those were really great questions. Uh, I have two final pieces of information that I want to share before uh, we take any more questions, though. So on this next slide, the pyramid of giving, these figures are helpful as you begin building your donor pool and planning how you're gonna raise the money necessary to win. Be mindful of the tactics that we just outlined above and thinking through the different types of donors that you have in your list. As I have said, using your candidates time efficiently and effectively in fundraising is gonna make them more likely to be willing to do it. 
Call time and candidate time is going to be mostly spent at the top part of this pyramid, the 20% of donors who can give about 50% of what you have to raise. The middle and lower level is where most donors live. It's where the online direct mail house parties and events that the staff can help produce and execute are the most useful. Now I'm going to end by talking about the second most important part of any successful fundraising plan. Most important thing to do is to create a plan and to execute it. The second most important thing to do is to be able to track what you're doing. Creating an effective system for your candidate and campaign is critically important to successful fundraising. Every note needs to be recorded, every thank you letter sent out, every pledge followed up on, and that means you have to create a system that works for you. That might mean an Excel sheet that houses all of your donors' contact information, notes from the calls, and donation amounts given, or it could mean investing in a fundraising database that will house all of that information that can produce call sheets and even manage your email sendings. But creating that system is critical. Uh, it is awful <laughs> getting on the phone with somebody and not knowing that you've already spoken with a donor or how much that donor has already invested in your campaign. Both of those scenarios are disasters when you're trying to fundraise. Right, the last piece of information I want to share is about the research into your donors. As I mentioned above, one of the key things we figured out with the, uh, the Speaker of the House who was uncomfortable with call time, and I found with pretty much any candidate or principal of an organization I've worked with, is the more information that I can provide to them on their donors, the more successful they are in that conversation with the donor, and the more comfortable they feel making the ask that I have suggested they make. That means doing research in Google, Facebook, news articles, anything you can about donors. This is where staff time should be primarily spent in doing this kind of donor research. The other space to look into donors is available contribution information that they have given to other candidates or nonprofit organizations. FEC data cannot be used to create a donor list, but you can use that information to help build your list and get ideas of how much your donor that you already are planning to talk to can give to you. All right, guys, that's the basics of budgeting and finance planning. Remember, set goals and benchmarks along a timeline. Think about your strategy and the tactics that you're going to use to target those donors and create your system to track your fundraising success. Uh, Chris, and thank you, Charlie, and thanks to everybody who was able to join the call tonight. So folks wrote in with a lot of good suggestions and thoughts about why this is challenging, but also why it's so important. Uh, Anna pointed out that lots of our communities are not wealthy, and we're asking folks to pitch in money that is often hard to come by. Lots of folks noted that they are shy, and sometimes talking to new people about these things is challenging. Uh, so this, we know, is not easy necessarily, but it is amazing and powerful, and we also got a bunch of incredible suggestions from all of you who've done this before. Many of you wrote in about pitching in to the Bernie Sanders campaign and noted how brilliant it was for him to keep the $27 in so many of his stump speeches. Uh, we had some suggestions from Lawrence who pointed out that it's always good to start with your friends. Uh, we heard from Damon who said, asking for money feels hard, but I knew that my candidate was doing something I believed in and that my contribution meant something. So uh, keep these principles in mind as you're thinking about your next steps and your campaign and you're building out your fundraising plan to work backwards from real goals that you believed in. So many of you have asked for copies of the slides and the slide deck and the recording will be up online on a Democracy for America website after this. I want to thank everybody so much again for joining us tonight and thanks again to Maggie Toulouse-Oliver, the next Secretary of State from New Mexico. Our next Political Revolution Night School is going to take place next Wednesday, September 7th at 9 p.m. Eastern. And there we'll be talking about operations and setting up your team for success. So we'll actually dig into some more of the questions that many of you are asking about, how do I file that paperwork? How do I make sure that I know those rules and regulations? And how do I build a team around me that is ready to you know, go out and, and take names and win? So that's the theme for next week. I want to also highlight again uh, that you can still sign up to host a movie night for our amazing round of films, The Brainwashing of My Dad. That's coming up September 15th. It'll be a great chance.
to build community with fellow DFA members and local progressives, uh, and you can sign up again uh, online for that as well. And uh, if you're not registered for next week's night school, you can go to democracyforamerica.com slash night school. So uh, if you missed a previous training again or you want to watch a recording of tonight's session and get the slides, go to democracyforamerica.com slash night school archive. Again, that is democracyforamerica.com slash night school archive. Thanks so much to all of our trainers and speakers. Thanks so much to all of you for all your hard work and vision. And we will talk to you next week. Have a great night.